classes we're doing here. I appreciate your hospitality. Um, go over a little bit of Force Bluntree. Nothing new or ingenious here. If you have something that works in your town, something you've been doing, please share it with us. Um, we had two really good days. Um, unfortunately, you're stuck with me again being here. Uh, once again, my name is Rich Stack, the cornerstone rep here for IFSI programs. It's a free class to your department, to those that are listening in the internet, cyber, Chad show, hard you show world. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, been in the fire service about 19 years. The last 13 have been on Chicago. I was a volunteer before that and worked part-time in North Palos. And um, Larry actually put this class together, Force Bluntry for the city. Something we were lacking at a little bit in Force Bluntry in the city was the knowledge of this tool up here at Halligan Bar. Everyone pretty much in our job got off the rig with a pick-headed axe and a pike bolt. Water rescue, a pick-headed axe and a pike bolt. I get the, I get the pike bolt, maybe to hook someone, but it was a six-footer. I'm not sure what the pickhead axe for was maybe ballast to help them sink so we didn't have to get them out. I don't know, but they always got off the same tools and this sat in the rig. And um, Larry helped develop a program that's really good. And then um, what else we got Matt and Danny, they'll introduce themselves, that's not my job. So thanks for being here. You didn't have a choice, I'm sorry, but it's going very well. We'll fly through the classroom as best we can. We won't spend much time talking about the doors because we have your door and another door down to actually play with with your equipment. I'm Larry McCormick, I started in 95 as a volley and uh, got a job in the Southwest Suburbs in Oak Lawn. Uh, left there for uh, FDNY, I was a fireman at a ladder company in Harlem, and uh, came back home to Chicago, got assigned to a truck in Inglewood, and I've been on a long-term detail to a rescue squad on the south side. But that said, um, that's, that's my introduction. We'll go from there, so, it's Matt. I'm Matt Burke, I've uh, been in about 14 years, and I'm just happy to be here with you today. Wow, cool. Damn right. Okay, yeah. I got to tell you for them guys. There you go. Now you know what we brought these, these guys. Two. Pretty chatty. These guys Wait until <laughs> you get them downstairs. They're gonna wow you. Yeah. All right, but, sir. Like Rich mentioned, um, this program we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We we had some of our senior members. Uh, Pat Lynch was a guy. Uh, he was a boss uh, in Squad Two on the North Side Fireman in Squad Five. He had met up in his travels a lot of guys from FDNY. And he knows the guys who wrote their forcible entry manual. So he approached him and said, hey, listen, we're trying to get this thing off the ground. Is it OK if we kind of recycle your stuff? And they said, absolutely. Just don't use it. Don't sell it. And whatever you want, it's, it's yours. So that said, we put kind of a Chicago ease twist on it. Uh, a lot of things you're going to see and we see in the metropolitan area here in the Midwest. Their forcible entry problems are, some of them are unique to you, New York. But for the most part, they're all they're all kind of the same, you know. Again, we're not reinventing the wheel, so a lot of this you may have seen before. So, um, and and when we put this together for the city, it was just kind of an awareness level class, just uh, to remind everybody, uh, it's to have a better understanding of forcible entry. We kind of focused on on the Halligan tool, but um, understand that it's labor intensive, and again, we're just scratching the surface here. So if you guys are familiar with that manual, I think we used, you used to be able to kind of peek at it online. It might be laying around the firehouse somewhere by a watch desk. It's about this thing. And it is, um, it has almost probably every forceful entry problem you might, uh, in, you know, incur in your travel. So it's, it's worth a read. It's, easy, it's an easy read. A lot of pictures for us. So uh, if you can find it or dig it up, it's definitely worth taking a peek at. What we're going to talk about here today are doors, locks, tool size up, forceful entry technique. Some problems, security problems we have, and then uh, some tricks of the trade, how to overcome some of these problems. So, um, a couple different types of doors, we got wood and metal, and then we're gonna talk about door components, the frame and the swing, and why they're important. So when it comes to wood doors, we have uh, hollow core, which would be the second one uh, over here. This is your typical interior uh, partition door, not structurally all that uh, terribly challenging to force. A solid core door could be a little more challenging, probably something comparable those um, panel doors, these could be uh, exterior or interior doors. You know, you got six panel doors, two panel doors, that type of thing. Um, and then as you go that way, you get a little more, um, I guess you'd say rural, um, south of I-80. But at the end of the day, all doors, the anatomy of all doors, have this frame, uh, this rail or this edge that goes around the inside. And then on the inside of the door, uh, are, there are going to be different um, components that keep the structural integrity of that door. But why the rail and edge is important, we'll get into um, down the road. So tubular metal doors uh, and hollow metal clad doors, these are uh, 
again, more doors we, we encounter in our travels. This is just a, nothing more than kind of a mall or a storefront door. Uh, and then a hollow or metal clad door. The, the thing about um, like a solid oak door, they're not, they're not solid oak. I mean, anybody does any uh, carpentering at all knows a solid piece of oak that's 80 inches by 36 inches would cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So they're, they're just oak skin. And the same thing kind of goes for metal, metal doors. A, a solid metal door would weigh a thousand pounds. The doors we have downstairs are hollow core metal doors. They're 400 pounds, but they're structurally pretty sound. So you can imagine, uh, there are probably, I mean, maybe on the back of a bank or a currency exchange, a diamond store, you might have some hollow or solid metal doors, but for the most part, they all have that frame, edge, or rail, and then some form of thing inside of them that keeps them structurally square, and then it's just a metal skin over them, okay? And then the same goes for this. This is just tempered glass, um, and we'll get into how to force these doors, how to do them kind of uh, uh, aggressively or more professionally if it's just a, uh, a water flow alarm or something like that. If the building's not on fire, we'll talk about how to get through those uh, in a little bit. And again, here's just what we were talking about. So uh, a, a metal door that you might find on the back of uh, a storefront is nothing more than a wood frame with some kind of, so maybe a solid core with a metal skin over it. That's gonna be a heavier door where this one has some form of either metal ribs or a lot of times that could be something as simple as cardboard. But again, at the end of the day, they all have that frame, that rail. So when it comes to uh, jams, <coughs> this is kind of important too. When, when we talk about forcible entry, one of the reoccurring themes is the redundancy of this is always attack the weakest link. And, uh, you know, again, none of us got into this to work harder than we need to. We're all kind of inherently lazy to one degree or another. So what we want to do is size the door up and then, and then go after the weakest link. So if you have this type of door, this is a typically, this would be an interior partition door. You might find this, uh, this type of frame on the interior of a multiple dwelling. Um, not so much the pre-hung Home Depot door, other than if it was an interior partition door, but on, on multiple dwellings and apartments and stuff, the apartment door, I found a couple of doors like this, and at the end of the day, the stop, what keeps the door from swinging all the way in is, is the door stop. It's kind of like a piece of shoe or cord around at the bottom. It's put on with brad nails, staples, basically. So when, when we talk about the technique and when we talk about going to force these doors, as soon as you hit this door and put the, uh, the tool in and pry down, this is gonna break away. It's gonna snap off. And that's not the end of the world because the art or the, the lost art of this because of uh, hydraulic force entry tools, we're, we're kind of losing basic firemanship, is getting this tool around that door to the back side of the jam. The tool needs to be set past this back side of the jam because this tool is nothing more than a, a lever. And what we're creating is a class one lever. So in using a lever, what do we need? What's one of the components of a lever? Fulcrum. A fulcrum. So the fulcrum becomes the backside of this jam. The tips of the tool have to go past that so we have something to pry off of. Okay, so that said, once the stop is cracked and broke away and you pull it away, it's really simple to sneak this tool between the door and the one box. It's, it's a home run. You can see into the apartment, you set the tool, somebody hits you in and you're in. This one's a little more challenging. This is the rabbit jam. That stop's not gonna break away. And Rich has got the here example. are your rabbit jams, okay? They're made, they're one piece. Now this is a knockdown frame, which has nothing to do with it means it's a three piece jam itself. Some could be one piece configuration, but all we want you to get here is this is stationary. This is part of the, the whole framing system. It is not removable, unlike a stop jam that you see in your residential interior doors that you call your partition wall, and that's the difference. You may see the door being wood with a metal frame. You may see a metal frame, metal door, a whole different configuration. It depends where you're at. And, and again, the, the challenge of this is, is getting that tool around this door, separating the door from the, from the, from the jam and getting it in position to uh, create that level. So again, these are just different pictures of, of, uh, of the different types of frames. This is your, this is your interior pre-hung door. This is stop is put on after the fact. This is one by, then that, like maybe half inch stop, that'll crack right off. Where again, these are metal, three piece knockdown metal frames. They could be backed up with sheetrock in that case. Sometimes if it's um, the uh, inside of a, or interior of a multiple dwelling that was built when building codes started to come into play, um, you might have two layers of sheetrock. 
or it could be backed up with a masonry wall, backfilled with concrete on the back side of a commercial building. So they can be, they can be, uh, they can get problematic. They can start to become kind of troublesome to force. So the swing of the door, well, why is this important? It's, it's important because we're gonna tap these doors two different ways. Um, this is a, a left-handed inward swinging door. Um, how do we know that? Well, it's recessed, you might say, yeah, it's recessed. But can you have a door that opens towards you recessed in a building? And the answer is absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, the difference between these two doors are the hinges and where they face, okay? If the hinges are inside or inside the occupancy, that door opens away from you. If the hinges you can visibly see on the outside of the building, that door opens towards you, okay? And again, we're gonna attack these uh, doors differently. Um, you might say, well, I would just turn around and give this door a boot and kick it in, and uh, we'll come to a slide later on where we'll, we'll show you you can't do that. Um, but this is nothing more than a pre-hung uh, door you could buy for probably you know, $109 at, at any hardware store. This one, if you turn around and you give this one a boot, is that gonna open? <laughs> right, like, it's like putting that door there. What's is, that, is that gonna open? No. Okay, have you ever seen guys do it on your job? Yeah. Sure. No. I know I haven't seen guys do it, right? They bounce off it, and then you're like, oh, what a sissy, this guy can't get through a door. Okay, there is a difference. Another thing, too, is is uh, with the doors, besides just, besides just that, can you tell by looking at the hinges, right? If the hinges are out, the door swings out. If the hinges are in, the door swings in. I need really stupid, easy things, remember, because I'm really ignorant, and I'm going to admit it. The other thing, too, sometimes you can tell by feeling as well, right? I run my hand, I'm doing my search. I'm in a building doing a search. I'm searching high and low, looking for exterior exits, windows, doors, trim. I may feel that trim. I run my hand across the wall and say I missed the hinge, but from the jam itself, we're not talking wall, but from the jam, if my hand drops in, the door's swinging in. If I ran my hand along that wall, I went from the jam right along to a smooth door, the door is out with the jam, the door swings out. Same principle as the hinges. Just another thing to indicate, in case you don't see the hinges, it's 2.30 in the morning, it's smoky out, Zero visibility, another option, maybe something else. Yeah. Just as a sidebar, okay, you expect to find doors that open away from you inside of a building, right? You're, you get to that, the second floor, you got three bedrooms, a bathroom, those doors open away from you. Which door opens towards you in, a, in the inside of a single family? The basement stairs, right? So if I open a door, is that the, is that the door I want to go charging headlong through? Absolutely not, that's, that's, that's the staircase or a closet or in a high rise, that could be an old time elevator shaft. Okay, firemen have fallen to their desks um, and, and doors that open towards them, bailing in, doing searches and stuff like that. But for what we're talking about here for this purpose, we're gonna attack this door a little bit differently than we're gonna attack that one. And we're gonna get into that when we get into the hands-on stuff, all right? So different types of locks. Key and knob and uh, the, the tubular deadbolt, you're gonna find on pretty much almost every door you incur, you know, especially in, in a more uh, metropolitan area. And then in addition to those locks, you might have a series of, of uh, surface-mounted locks or rim locks, vertical deadbolts, that type of thing. Uh, mortise locks um, are locks that can be in old-time wood doors, which I'm sure you have here in town, or they're recessed in, in metal doors. Um, and some metal doors, like the exterior, some metal doors have the recessed mortise, mortise locks. And then your panic hardware that you'd find on those tubular uh, frames. So, just a key and knob lock. A lot of times these aren't even key. They just rely on the deadbolt, but they're not terribly difficult because you got maybe a half inch, three quarter inch throw on those. These are, uh, let's skip ahead to the deadbolt. Okay, that's, you're gonna have uh, this one as well. This could be a half inch throw or up to an inch and a half now. It kind of depends on how much money you want to spend. And then in addition to those two, depending on where you operate or what's going on in that occupancy, you know, you could be in Burr Ridge, but if they're making meth in that house, they want to keep us out. Uh, and other drug dealers, um, you can have a series of these. these. These locks that are mounted on these doors in addition to um, the deadbolts and the key and knob. So where you see these, I know best in our older homes, some of our older uh, ordinary, older homes that were uh, built a long time ago with custom doors made in. They have the mortise locks, they'll have these rim locks. They're on your older wooden doors we predominantly see them on. And then what happens is they, well, that ain't much protection, so they add those deadbolts, they add the other additional things. So they may not use them anymore, they may still be on the door, they may still be using them, just in case. How do these work, too? The other locks Larry showed you, what are we actually trying to defeat to get that door open? 
trying to defeat the throw of the latch, right? How about the bottom one? Does that work with that one? No. That one's right. It's a drop pin. What are you getting to defeat in that scenario? What, what holds it in place? What the screws? Weakest link screw right. on that. You're going to actually have to separate the screws from the wood for that. There is no separation of the jam and door to get that latch to clear the throw. Yeah. So, again, the reoccurring theme defeat the weakest link. In this case, like Rich said, it's going to be whatever screws, the roofing nails, whatever the guy had in his pouch that afternoon. Uh, but once the male is married to the female, they, they don't come apart. Um, I always use the, uh, uh, I talk about like Jerry Seinfeld's door. If you ever noticed, he's got a series of these locks on his door. And what they do in New York, because the bad guys know how to, they pull the cylinder, they don't kick your door and they pull the cylinder and pick your lock. And we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. But what they'll do is they'll have a series of them, three or four of them. They'll lock two and leave two unlocked. So if I pull all your locks, I unlock the two that are locked, but then the two that were unlocked, I lock them, I still can't get into your apartment. Okay, that's why you'll see a series of these, because the bad guys in that neighborhood know how to pick these locks. So, not quite if you're going drunk, like I would normally know what I wasn't sure which one, I'd be locked out for a while. Right. So, not that that's ever happened. But no. again, this is what we see all the time, and then those surface mounted locks, and then any kind of improvised, keep the bad guys out locks. We'll talk about those in a minute. Here's your mortise locks in older style doors. We have, you know, tons of these it's everywhere in the city, you guys do as well. Uh, and then, uh, this type of lock would be maybe recessed into uh, a steel metal door. So not, not a terrible uh, throw here. It's not even keyed. You know, you turn your handle, that's gonna open, but this could be up to an inch and a half long. So that's what we're talking. Here we go, here's another example of the mortise lock. Now, uh, this is basically panic hardware. We're gonna find these on the uh, back of um, commercial occupancies and on the front because of what fire? What fire changed building codes in that you need to have doors that open outwardly. Air Coit Theater. Air Theater. Air Theater fire. Correct. So that's because, nice. you know, in a rush, if we start. get a, you know, a hundred people pinned in this doorway, if somebody leans on this door, the door opens and everybody falls out. Okay. Unless it's an E2 yeah. night club. E2 night yeah. club, it didn't work out so well. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. 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 This is, um, this isn't a terrible door. This is our commissary. It's, it would be terribly challenging to force. This is a three-quarter screw on that panic bar, and then a deadbolt. Not, not anything that I would go, oh boy, I need a torch or a saw or a framing rafter square to get in this. This is not going to be, uh, with the proper technique, all that much trouble. This one's going to be a little more trouble because as they lock this, it goes into the sill, it goes up into the header. I'm not so much worried about this one. It's the top and bottom. How do we force those? Not a big deal to get this one. This one's a little more challenging because you have to attack this like you would Normally at, at shoulder waist height, you have to do it above your head. This one's not, not a big deal. These two have two pins that go into um, the latch and the hinge side. Um, again, we would attack this like, like we normally would, but again, that pin could be two inches long. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be, gonna give us a hard time. And then this one, <coughs> this thing slides back and it's basically a, a drop bar, more or less. If I got around to the rear and I saw this on a door, if I don't have a saw, I'd probably call for one. I start working on the door, maybe I get it, maybe I get lucky, but this one's probably uh, gonna give you a hard time. And, then, and that's what you'll see over the course of this. Anytime you see anything out of the ordinary, especially on the back of an occupancy, depending on the occupancy, if you don't have a saw, call for one, have it, have it uh, in route, because you're probably gonna need it. Something else on the back of those doors, and it will come up on a better slide, but the doors when you go to your commercial structures, Sometimes I like to see the hardware, and when I don't, it's what's worried me. If I see a, a flat skin metal door, there's gotta be something locking it. I don't see carriage bolts there. I don't see any nameplate like that. It's an armored door or whatever. What do I have there? I don't know. I like those doors that give me some type of indicator of where to work or what to do. The other ones, I see nothing, everything smooth. It ain't there by a magnet, is it? I mean, there's not just sheer luck that it's closed. There's something there keeping it together. Yeah, Yeah. because then you don't know where to start. So. Just the, the anatomy of a lock, at the end of the day, um, most locks nowadays have uh, these recesses here, the toe and uh, heel and toe locking. So if you were to go and attack these with uh, bolt cutters, you'd have to cut both sides. Um, these are a little bit newer style locks other than the one at the top right. You can kind of see that heel and toe little recesses. They go, it goes down into the lock shackle and it's basically like little ball bearings locked into those two recesses. This is the earring lock. Um, 
Uh, again, most of the time when we see these now would be uh, at like used store places, those, those types of places. But just to defeat these, this one, this, this um, shackle, I guess you'd say, slides back one way or the other. We're not sure which way, so you might have to cut both sides. This one, this pin slides back into the body. So if we cut it here, we should be able to pull these pins out. Cut it here, pull that pin out, and actually drop away. This is the one we see more, more times than not. Um, you probably saw it on the white work van you were driving into the firehouse this morning behind. Um, but we, we have a lot of these on roll down gates. So American Lock was probably the most popular, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It was like the first generation. And what they used to tell us was cut, take the saw and cut it across American, where it said American, you cut it. Well, now there's, you know, however many different manufacturers of this type, type of lock. So um, that's not always the case. But what we could say is um, if you cut um, three quarters of the way from the keyway, where it just so happens America, a Series 2000 is on this particular lock, three quarters of the way from the keyway, or put a pipe wrench on it, you can twist and snap these things off. Basically, this is what it looks like. Okay, you'll cut that pin and the lock should fall away. All right, we could use a saw, we could use a torch. Um, you know, again, you're only limited by your imagination. But if you do have the pipe cutters or the pipe wrench, the problem is now these locks are recessed. Okay, so you, you know, again, every time the bad guy figures out how to break a lock, they, you know, they, they improve it. So now these are recessed. So you can't get the jaws of the um, pipe wrench on it to, to spin them off anymore in some, some instances. So attack the weakest link. Again, swing the door. This is all the size of the locking devices. Check for heat condition. Check for resistance or sound the door, top, center, bottom. And the reason for that is at the top and bottom of the door for an inward opening door, I don't expect a lot of resistance. There should be a bounce or deflection. I hit, I want to hit that thing, the tool should bounce off. There should be, or if I put my foot on the bottom of the door, it should go in a little bit. If it doesn't, that means there's probably another locking device, especially at the bottom in urban areas. We'll, we'll get into that. If you sound an outward swinging door, you don't expect, if I start banging on that door, if I'm that guy, which doesn't have plan B, that door's not gonna swing inwardly. What'll happen is I'll knock that whole system to the ground. So to, to, to sound an outward, or, uh, an outward swinging door doesn't make a lot of sense because the door is stopped. There's a door stop all along that frame, so there's not gonna be give in that door. But the inward opening door, at the top and bottom, there should be some bounce. I expect it to be solid in the middle because that's where the locks are, all right? If it's solid at the top and bottom, I might have one of those doors like that yellow one with the push bar with the lock that goes down in the header or something a little more improvised. We'll get into uh, in a little bit. And try before you pry. Um, if I'm honest with you guys, you know, I can tell you, I, I was working on a door one time, boss told me, hey, go get that apartment. I went down, he came up after me, after I was going through all the moves, and he reached over my shoulder and he opened the door and, and he walked in the apartment. And it was a covering boss, so not only did I embarrass myself, but because it was a guy from a covering boss, I embarrassed my company. So that said, uh, always try before you pry. And again, the weakest link, that's what we're talking about. $100 lock put on with 10 cent screws. And, and that's what you'll find. If you take the time, take a second and do a size up, you don't have to work as hard. And that's when we talk about tools, uh, traditional tools, hydraulic, power tools, especially tools, just a couple thoughts, just a, a, a bit of real brief history uh, on this tool. The way this tool came about was that there was a fire in Lower Manhattan in, um, in the 30s. And uh, the fire department said, hey, hot, they, they got into a bank and they lit the bank on fire as the bad guys left to cover their tracks, that makes sense. So the fire department said, hey, how did they get into this bank? And they said, well, they used this tool. It was like a four foot tall tool that had a, a curve on it, like a shepherd's hook, all right? And it had an offset striking surface, but it was just a little nipple. So to drive the tool in, it had a, a basically a chisel at the other end. So they used it as a lever, okay? And they got it in the bank. So um, they took it, it rode on the rig, but having that curved pick at the top, it was hard to drive the tool in. So this guy, Chief Kelly, put a 90 on it, the ads, all right? And now we had, a 90 degree striking surface, we could drive this tool in. Well, this guy, uh, Hugh Halligan, he liked the pick of the other tool, he put the pick on and um, basically sold it to Boston. Boston Fire Department was the first one to ride with these. Other than the company, the firehouse in, where he lived in Queens 
that truck had the Halligan tool first, and then he sold it to Boston, and then the rest is, is just. Do you have any of these tools that we know you guys don't, because we looked and someone went in the basement and checked? Do you have any Halligan bars with that marking on it? AMDG? It's worth about two grand. Or, like Maddie says, his, the first bars, he had his signature on it. And this fork doesn't look like the forks nowadays. A lot of thought was put into this tool as it evolved. Okay, we'll get into the anatomy of it in a bit. But this fork here was, was straight on wedge shape. It was chisel shape. So if you have any of those, instead of Halgan here, it would be his signature. I'll give you two brand new bars for, for that one. If you know anybody, um, let me know. So, uh, that, so, so again, when we put this together, the idea was that I'm, I work on the south side. If they detailed me over here on the west side, and I was working for Rich, and I don't know him, I show up in the morning, and right out of the gate, we catch a fire, and I'm on the tool. We're speaking the same language citywide. That that was our thought. We wanted continuity in this program. So just so we're on the same page, we already talked about the, the, the ads. Okay, this ads is a striking surface, but it's also a cold chisel if we take care of it. All right. If you don't have to shave with this, mm -hmm. but you want it reasonably sharp. If I've got some carriage bolts on a boarded up house, we can share the, the carriage bolt heads off if we take care of it. The pick. There's nothing more than the pick, okay? You want this nice and sharp too, because as I'm opening up doors and windows, and I'm trimming out floors and stuff like that, I, I want this to be varied. So this, I, I want sharp, all right? So this is the neck of the tool, and then the shaft. When we get to this end, we've got the shoulders and the crotch for obvious reason, and um, we'll go through the... Why it's important to know these landmarks, as you'll see as we talk forward on the tree, we'll give terms or terminology, uh, strike, drive, and stop. Drive, these are listed rent landmarks and references, and you'll see why we want to know the term neck and crotch for when we use these tools. That way, if he says, hey, drive it to the neck, I know exactly what he's talking about. And that makes sense, I'm sure. But just so you know, again, the original tool was, was straight. Now it's curved. You have a concave side that looks like a C, kind of, sort of, as I look at it, and the beveled side. All right? It's, there, it's designed this way to create more leverage. All right? So, you know what? We'll, we'll the picture. All right, so, and again, it, it, it matters, and you'll see when we get our hands on the door. So, here we go. So here's, the, if you have the choice, if I show up in the morning, and I beat reach, reach into the firehouse, and I've got the choice of grabbing these two tools, they're both pretty much the same, right? It's the same lever, it creates the same mechanical advantage, it's the same length for the most part, okay? But the difference is, in its design, so, not only is this, this is drop forge, it's one piece. You can bend this, you won't break this, okay? I, I've never seen one broken. But this is three pieces. It's pinned here and here, and things fail at connections. Buildings fail at connections, right? This will fail, these I've seen broken, all right? And the other problem is the ads, okay, originally looked like this, now it's kind of curved. And that's curved for a reason, because we gotta sneak it past the doorstop. We'll talk about that in a bit. But, um, so at the end of the day, when we go to four stores, this is the biggest difference. This is a credit card. We, what are you talking about? You gotta get this tool between the door and the jam, right? To get to the backside. So this is like sliding a credit card in there, and this is like trying to do it with a door chock. And that's, that's at the end of the day, that's the, the biggest difference between them. Weight-wise, they both weigh like eight and a quarter, or real close. Um, What's the little uh, lever on the one in your right hand? Uh, right up at your hand. Notch. These right two? There, okay. Notch, yeah. okay. Difference between these two. Very similar. Both good bars. If I had to pick, I'd take these two over this any day of the week. If you can get someone to weld a bead around the head of the tool so you can uh, attach the ads end to the shaft and the fork end to the shaft, I would do that because they have failed. Okay? The other thing we don't like is the curvature and the straightness of the ads on that one, the curvature of the forks on that one, and the thickness of it. Uh, the red door we have down there, and even uh, your door, you'll see it's definitely harder to get these forks around that door because of its curvature. As far as for this one, all this is is a connection point to put a chain to, a rope. Maybe you want to put a strap on this, a shoulder strap to carry it over your shoulder. Maybe you want to throw it off a roof, you get sent up to a roof. You want to throw it over a roof to uh, ventilate the window below you, something like that. You want to ballot a window, another place to connect to. What I don't like about this is that if you ever do any one-handed operation, with the eyelet down here at the fork end, what we have, and it'll show up in the video, we can square these ends off. We can 90 degree them. So if I was by myself, 
You can drive this with yourself with a sledgehammer, with an axe. You can get this in a door, hold it by yourself, one person. You can slide an axe on it, and it will clean off unless you 90 degree this. With those on there, you can't do that. So really no added benefit to have them. If it does, great, no big deal. But I would take either one of these two over your paratech bar. The Hooligan bar is fine. This is called a club bar or something like that. Um, the one that's up in our is the uh, pro bar, which is really good as well. But things work well. It, at the end of the day, if you're going to fire yeah, these off, because if I go up and he's got the saw, we got to take the top four windows as well, that you can fire these off. If you do that, don't send this into the window, because inevitably this is going to get hung up on all everything that's inside that window. You won't, you're going to lose your tool. So if you, when you send this off, send the hooks into the window. And, and there's really, you know, a piece of webbing, put dirt pitch on this thing, measure it down and send it, you're good. Or I've got like a three or four foot loop, six foot loop of webbing. Girth hitch this to your pike pole, hang over the side, bring it in, tap the window a little bit so the guy searching that's just standing up to open the window doesn't buy a, a, a halogen in his face. This is, these are nice, but you don't, nest, you don't, you don't really, you don't really need them. They're kind of more or less in the way. It, and again, not to be a dead horse, but the guy who designed this tool, he probably didn't force doors for a living. You brought the FDIC, made millions of dollars, I'm sure, and sold them, but people that know better. Sat behind a computer, designed it, and because it's, it's, yeah, it's how about nice. length? Let's talk about length over here. What's a good length of a halogen bar? So we're talking about leverage, right? So an eight foot, <laughs> yeah, right? Eight foot halogen bar would be great, right? It's an immense amount of leverage, right? I've got a great lever. But the problem with that eight footer or a 40 foot or 40 inch uh, halogen bar is that you have to be able to operate on a door inside of the boundaries of the door. If, if I have an outward swinging door uh, like this one that's recessed behind a building three feet, okay, when I go to use that tool, uh, it, it could be too long. Um, per building codes, doors have to be, a passenger door has to be what, anybody know? 32 inches at least, right? So if I have a 40, a 34 inch bar and I'm working on a 32 inch door, it's like Austin Powers in that golf cart in that movie, right? It just, it doesn't work, it's too, it's too, too big. So it's 30 inches long so that I can work on that, that skinny 32 inch door. Most doors are 34 to 36, handicap doors could be 48. I can work on that door and not step out of bounds, okay? And it's also nice that it, it uh, marries your value, and I think that might be the next one. So it marries to your irons, right? It marries nice to your irons, too. This bottom picture here, this is just a knockdown ball. Uh, you use it on peak roofs, but more or less for a sports entry. It's got this welded uh, female keeper for your ads. You can grab it with one hand. You don't have to fumble with them. It's not that awkward or cumbersome. And then you guys probably, you know, everyone marries their irons together. So, does anybody know uh, why there you go. the halogen fits so well with, with your axe? How, what's the length of your axe handle? Anybody know? It's 32 inches, right? I know you know. It's 32 inches. And why, why with 32 inches, why does that set up a red flag when it comes to building structures? How big is a framing hammer? 16 inches. So, when we're talking about building instruction, right? Studs. Rafters are on 16, not all the time, but a lot of times, okay? Your axe handle is 32 inches, I'm, I'm going on a sidebar here, but if you find one rafter and you lay your axe handle down, you can lay out that roof. So if you, unless you want to make a four by box, if you want to make louver cuts, you can cut down between two rafters and, and open it up, okay? So it's just, it's a measuring stick, more, more or less. So. Uh, so use it to your advantage. So when you're talking about um, maintenance on these tools, this is not a good idea. Taking it to a grinder, it's fast. I know we're all inherently lazy. But the problem is the heat from the wheel takes the temper out of the tool. And uh, and it, it's parade ready, it looks good, it's shiny, it's ready to go. But as soon as you hit a nail on that floor or go to drive it through and it hits a stop, it's gonna get boogered up. But once you, it's boogered up, it's you gonna look get at these two, time. this one's a little boogered up a little bit. Some things and dents in it. Well, this one's kind of not sharp, but a nice edge on it to get in between a jam or a door. I will tell you too, when you guys force these metal proton stairs, you probably have to go back to the firehouse and do some work on them because it, it's going to, you're going to flop the motion up the end of the ad bed. Just like this one, that's probably why this one is. They were using this one the past two days, and, that, and that's going to happen because as you're, 
as you're pounding this and it hits the stop or trying to sneak around the stop, well, until you do, it takes that edge off your tool. So almost every time you use it, you gotta go back. Take the basket file that's buried down, it's under the workbench or at the bottom drawer of your, your, your tool cabinet, and you just gotta use a little elbow grease. It doesn't take very long. Even that tool that's, that needs some attention, it's, it's gonna take 10 minutes. It, it doesn't take very long. So pay attention to your tools, they'll, they'll take care of you. This has gotta be sharp. Again, this edge, not only is this curved, but at the very end of this tool, you'll notice there's another pronounced angle. That's there for a reason, take care of that. And then this, like I said, I like this, I like this sharp, like needle sharp, because I, I want the tool to do the work. I don't wanna have to drive this any harder than I need to. If I gotta take up some old floor, I want this to bury uh, into the old floor. All right, just talk about some hydraulic tools here. Got a picture up there of uh, manual or engine power hydraulic tools, spreaders. Um, we have the capability in our job, or the squad zoops, they have cordless uh, hearse tools, they have hydraulics. There's other ones out there. Genesis makes a nice tool, uh, so do some other manufacturers. That's something we're actually starting to bring onto some forced entry jobs now, a cordless spreader to the rear. We have VPS, which you'll see coming up, we use them on them. Popping burglar bars off a masonry building off the brick and block works phenomenally well. Are we going to drag the power unit with those? Probably not. Would I? Could I? You get back to a structure and you have something that's out of the ordinary, it's going to take you a lot of time. Or the saw ain't working, or the blade breaks, whatever. That might be one of those things you call for. But something that's really easy to bring with you and helps you for force one tree works very well on inward swing doors, not so much outward. It's your ramp tool, okay? Um, we'll also show you a picture of a hydro ramp. Like that a little bit better because it's a one-man operation. Um, Rabbit tool works very, very well. It gets you about four to six inches of spread, depending, 10,000 pounds of force. Like you guys, ours is stored in a bag, same as you guys. But what happens in our job, because you know we're so intelligent, is that it's stored in a bag with the bleed valve open or the bleed valve shut with some pressure on it so they can't get disconnected. They think something's wrong because they can't get the hose connected. So that's mistake one. If they do get the hose connected, okay, they forget the bleed valves open and they're pumping away going, man, this thing don't work. There's something wrong with it ain't pumping. Not true, okay? Also, there is a limitation with this tool. Can this pump work in any position? It cannot, okay? Let's make sure the bleed valve is shut and it is. It will pump fluid down. It'll pump fluid flat. It will not push fluid up. So what well, guys go to buildings, go to work, as they figure this out, great. Hell, oh, shit, forget about the bleed valve. But then they're pumping like this, they think there's something wrong with it. Here you could be popping doors in an apartment building left and right, but they think it's broken because they're holding their pump up. Unlike the hydro ring, which is basically this without the hose, that can work in any position. And like Matt said yesterday, put it under, what'd you say, man? Uh, usually, uh, weekly, you're supposed to put that on a load. So whether you use it on your door or you pick up just put a little pressure on it because the seal's in it. Over time, if you're not putting that fluid through it, it'll dry wrap the seals and then it'll not allow you to put the pressure on it. So put it on the couch every week because you'll have your load laying on the couch usually or your chair. Lift the couch up once in a while and you're good. So if, if you do if you do find this, uh, that it doesn't pump on the first pump, like this one's in good shape, if it doesn't, put it under a load all the way open. You've got to bleed, see that? You gotta yes. bleed the air out. So just place this in a position where, and just leave it sit for, it depends on how much time, you know, maybe an hour, it might take all day, but eventually the hydraulics will reset themselves and, and you know, the bubbles or whatever will come back to the top and it'll be ready to go on one pump um, the next time you go to use it. You guys can use this, I, I don't know about your h and door, but you can use it on a red door. So if you guys haven't used it or haven't really been exposed to it in a while, you know, that's one of the things you guys can use. And, and not for nothing, when we went through this a year or two ago when we were doing all the trucks, got, companies were coming in with this and, and the men didn't know how to put it together. So if you haven't looked at it in a while, just look at it, just kind of re, you know, kind of take a peek. Uh, I know it's on the inventory, when you check it off, yeah, it's there every morning. But just make sure we know how to put it together because when you're over your skis and you're the guy in the hallway and everybody's looking at you, screaming at you, hey, let's get in this door, that's not the time to try to figure, troubleshoot this thing. You should be able to do it just sort of blindfolded over. Just remember too, when you're lifting with this, you don't always have to go from the teeth. You can actually lift off the base of this as well. 
it is acceptable to lift off that area as well. Say you're just not getting a good bite, you get open up a little bit, you want to slide in it further on an angle to lift off these areas, you can. And not for nothing, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan, especially of the apartment, you got a lot of door. The problem with this tool is because of this tool, the men don't know how to use this. Because they're like, well, we got that thing, and you, know, you pump, and you know. And that's the guy that doesn't know how to put it together when he goes to use it. So, um, and just know that that, that that tool has limitations just like the halogen bar and any other tool we have in our toolbox. You're, it's limited to that 10,000 pounds. And it's limited to that four to six inches of spread depending on what tool you have. So you have to, as part of doing your size up, is it gonna work or is it not gonna work? You know, so you don't wanna start something like Larry said and then everybody's staring at you and you, you think to yourself, oh shit, I can't finish this job. Uh, as far as the, the power unit, the whatever you guys have, Genesis, I would consider it. The whole module, right? The, the, night, the whole module and two hertz. The night before last, we had five doors that the guys got back there with saws and were like, eh. Well, our guys, and it could have been any company, but we had spreaders. We have battery powered spreaders. They popped every door. The door, These doors were so challenging when they were popping them, the bricks were falling off the building. You're, you're not going to force that with, with hand tools. So consider it, if I got one door in the back, and we'll get it eventually, great, we'll, we'll go after this thing. But if I've got five doors, somebody should get on a handy talk and go, listen, not for nothing, if the next truck in or the next, if the ambulance, somebody, bring the power unit to the back. I'm sure one of them is reasonably portable where two members can, can carry it to the back. Um, it, it's gonna save you a lot of time. You know, Ultimately, what we want to get to is, is have plan A, B, and C. Yeah. I know for us, when we go to, let's say, Larry and I are working together, and we're on the back rig, our job is the rear. We're going to a rear of a commercial structure. Guaranteed, we're both bringing a set of irons or we're bringing a halogen bar or traditional force punch tools. But we're also bringing a metal cut and saw. We're also bringing a rabbit tool. We're bringing plan A, B, and C. And also, the ultimate thing we can bring is our cordless hearse. We have that option. We have the option of other specialty tools that are coming up. What do you have? What is your truck too? What do you guys bring into the rear? What do you have to bring? Well, I see plan A, B, and I know you got a saw. You already have plan A, B, and C. And, and the spreaders. I mean, it takes two guys, but you can get the spreaders back there, you know. And then on that note, you know, uh, commercial building, we're six foot pipe pole for, like Rich said, water rescue, hazmat, guy hanging from a water tower. But if it's a commercial building, it's an eight and a 12. Okay, that's another thing, you know, just the other day, I'm like, really? These guys are getting off the rigs. We had two in a row with ceilings that were 12, 14 feet high. You, you need that longer pipe pole. Bring two pipe poles, they're not terribly heavy. Bring the eight and the, and the 12, and just, if you don't you need the 12, you throw it and you pick it up afterward and you go home. So it's always nice to have it with you. Um, and then of course saw. So uh, I apologize about the top picture. I know that's a country cutting saw, but the 950 K12 partner, whatever you guys uh, have. Um, these are metal cutting discs. Um, this is a diamond tip metal concrete wood cutting blade. It, it, it would cut two by fours, but not roofs. It's just diamond tip. It has heat releasing fins. Um, I forgot if these, do you guys have uh, access to a blade like that? Do you guys have that or just composites? No, we have it. Uh, you do? One, one of the okay. Trip, yeah. okay, just just passing this on because this happened to us. We had like the first generation of this blade and it didn't have, it's hard to see from where you're at, but it has a bunch of a series of six holes in it um, to release the heat. It builds up an immense amount of heat and it had these fins um, to help release the heat as well. What we didn't notice was um, on the saw in a uh, rescue company on the south side, it, it um, started to build up heat. It started to get these hairline fish fissures in it, hairline cracks that every morning we'd, get, we'd pick the saw up, start it, yeah, it's running, top it off, looking at it, put it back to the rig, we, we missed it. And then uh, one of our guys went to use it and it seized on a hinge it shot shrap metal through the shroud. It, it kind of decimated the, the, the blade. And this, the shroud and the arm that goes back to the saw tore away from the body and was hanging by the belt. Okay, that guy's lucky. I mean, he's lucky he didn't get killed. Um, dangerous. So we took a picture of it and sent it out to, there's only a handful of companies that have this because it's so expensive. But we sent it out to everybody, and then they they pulled the, the job pulled all those blades off, and then we got the newer uh, the boot. Yeah. So just pay attention. It's kind of you got to kind of take a look at that because everybody 
I mean, everybody missed it, and then it happened, and, and luckily nobody got And we're not saying he didn't do anything wrong. It was a hinge, hard part of the door. Yeah, case hard and hinge. Also, I mean, unlike a roof where you go in a full throttle, right? You go in a roof, you give it a full RPM, you go into the roof, you bury it in. Can you do that with metal? Can you just give it a full RPM and jam it right into the metal? You can't. And then, I don't, we don't know that happened. We're just saying that could cause that to happen as well. You can't bury a metal cutting blade in the metal, especially if it's like a metal door you're cutting. What happens at full RPM? What does that saw want to do? Walk all over, right? You may have to start slow, throttle the trigger, feather it, get a, a cutting point, get a groove, work your way. You bury that into a hinge, it may happen to the best blade. I don't know. Just to get something to be aware of. Do you, guys, do you guys have the ability to purchase? Or is that the chance? No. So, I, I know that happened to me before the, where I worked. Was they put a uh, max? They put a. They bought a diamond tip blade. They put it on the K12. K12 is generally the Husqvarna, the partner run at 5400 max RPM. So you have to have at least a maximum uh, RPM blade of 5400. Well, they bought the blade because they didn't know any better, and it was a max RPM of 4600, 4, 4800. Mm -hmm. So. The max RPM of the blade was less than the max RPM of the saw. So when they put the blade on the saw, the af after a little bit, nobody nobody really paid uh, too much attention to it. The blade, as you used it, would start to flex on on the saw because of the amount of RPM the amount the saw was working. So we were all looking at it, going, "What you know? What, what the hell is going on here?" And it was a brand new blade. But we eventually took it off and put two and two together that this didn't match this. So it's it's another thing to look at when you're buying or you get new you, the bosses come down with these blades. And again, keep in mind this is fire and ship one on one. Like we already played with it. You know, don't hey Johnny, we're playing with it. Steer those or, or store them in the same compartment as your what was that we got right? We got that. Which the one? Crap one you're talking about. That's what they bought us. The, the ones there? Yeah, we were playing me and Johnny were playing with it when they bought it for us and we realized, you know, it sold us and told oh it cuts everything great, blah blah. So Took it out back and uh, acquired some stuff from a mm -hmm. certain property in the area and, and did some test cutting. And we found a it obviously it doesn't do. We, you know, we found what it was good at. And we found what it sucked at. And we found actually the same problem you're talking about. So and we're working over it. Yeah. 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 The other thing too is you know the the people that purchase. I mean they don't know any better. They're they're do, they're trying to do the best they can for you. No, they're not. <laughs> well, we, we hope that they're trying to. That's your outside voice. We, we, hope, we hope that they are, but one of the things we found was that our bosses went to a, a trade show and they bought a blade and they paid $460 for this blade. It's a diamond tip blade, similar to that. And they brought it back and they're like, hey, check this out. This is awesome. And we, you know, the guys kind of looked at it and they're like, how much did it cost? Oh, well, it's 460 bucks. You know that the same blade that we have on our saw right now that it looks like identical was two hundred and sixty dollars. So they don't you know, we hope that they're trying to do the best, but they really don't have any idea. Because they don't remember this stuff. No offense, Chief. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> He's leaving. <laughs> He's retiring. Just guy ain't me. Respect these tools, guys. Defying time. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we just ran through a chainsaw thing. All our trucks were put in. Got, finally got chainsaw, right? We've had it for 20 years in the suburbs. But um, what, we're, what we're just trying to uh, impart on, on the members is be careful. Be be aware that these tools don't know the difference between us and, and the building we're working on, and they will hurt you. So just respect them. Uh, and don't use them past their, uh, what, what they're designed for. So. Just a couple different specialty tools. I know, uh, and I understand uh, this more or less applies to us, but we'll just burn through this real quick. This is a great tool. We'll talk about it, how it operates in, in a bit. You could probably go to the back of a fire trade magazine and spend $100 on this, or just go to the machine shop down the road and have it fabricated for you. It's a, it's a lock breaker. If you only have one saw and they're working on the storefront and to the left, you can go to the right and break the, and break the locks uh, and throw the doors up, okay? Um, these are all lock pulling devices, basically. We'll talk about, we've got uh, a couple pictures on how that works uh, as we go. But here's a real cheap one, right? It's just a pair of uh, channel locks or modified pliers. At the bottom, I understand it's hard to see, but this is bent, heated and bent to a 90 degree angle. 
and this one is, is the straight top handle. What they've done is they've honed down and made basically uh, a flathead screwdriver out of this one in that 90, and that becomes the key tool. We'll talk about that in a bit. Torches, um, uh, acetylene or uh, uh, petrogen in a pack, easy to transport. Um, the problem with these this time of year, you've got to keep that lock up or that door up to burn it. Whereas this arc air thing is very portable and that burns at like 10,000 degrees. It burns under water, it burns through concrete. Uh, it's, it's an awesome tool. That kind that comes off the rig once in a while when we have horse entry problems, uh, depending on the occupancy. And then uh, this is a one man bunny tool or rabbit tool. And uh, Rich mentioned that earlier. So, uh, But this is how the lock pulling device works. And again, you can spin these out too because they're threaded a lot of times. So with that channel lock, you can spin these locks out. Uh, at the end of the day, this is called a K-tool. This is sort of a, a sharp edge tool. You slide down over the lock, pull it. What you want to do is look at the back side of that lock because the back side of the lock will dictate what end of this tool we use. Either you're going to use the bent shape to reach in and turn the lock, which would du duplicate this pear shape, okay? And it just it, that throws the throw. Or this comes down to basically uh, a flathead screwdriver, and that would simulate the stem on a rim lock. So if we pull these locks or spin them out, all you got to do is look at it. Don't let it hit the ground and kick it down the street. Look at it, set it on the ground, and then you reach in with one end of the tool. Brian just said something over here, and, and we know you don't have these. The first day someone thought you did, they used them on the rig. You don't have pay tools. We know that. He just said just use the halogen. You can. You can use the forks, get over a lock, the pull a cylinder. You can actually use the pick, and if you can get in there on this and actually throw the latch as well, if not a screwdriver. Also, you'll see there, and Larry will have it inside, there's a pair of pliers or channel, uh, channel locks and or a vice grip. You can use them. You can actually modify them to actually be a key tool as well. Difference is if you do the modification on a pair of channel locks like that, you might want to heat them up and bend them and offset the bend because if you squeeze the channel locks against the door, you have a gloved hand, you can't get tight, right? So they're kind of on an angle. They're not getting much bite of the teeth on the cylinder itself. You heat the head up and you bend the handle only just like this. Now the, the head of the tool can be against the door. You can be off at a slight angle and you can grip it and spin out or lock as well. Other options, the officer tool, the A tool, some guys may carry that. That may work as well. All those are ways of pulling cylinders. The K tool works very well though and doing minimal damage compared to some others. For the hell going to work though, need some really good edges on here as well. And if they're your recessed ones or guarded or where they have a very low profile, so that's hard to get the halogen tool over. Yeah, those are hard to spin out. And even with that, with, with the recessed ones or one that are flat to the door, you're probably not going to get it with, with any of these box ones. Uh, but you can try. This is a modified Rex tool, so your ad, it's nothing more than an A tool, your ads would slide in there. That's something kind of handy to keep in your pocket. Um, but this, when I got the old one, what we had in our uh, SWAT bag, it was just a wonder bar or just a, a carpenter's nail pulling bar. You, you know, you grind out an A on that, put some edges on it, you could pull locks with that. And, and then all you've got to do is fashion some kind of key tool. So you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money. Just we have this part too. And the problem is too, like the lock breaker, K tool, oh man, it sits in the compartment. Do I, is that something I normally bring with me? No, we carry enough crap in our pockets. It is, or shit you don't want to carry with you. So I'm probably not bringing that stuff, but knowing if you have or you have the capability. There was a building a while back, I sh I'm like, that would have been a good building to bring this, but I didn't bring it with me in the pocket. I read an article in Fire Engineering by someone, might have been done, I don't know who, and, oh, put that in your pocket and carry it. I'm sorry, I'm not going to. I have enough crap that I don't want, and I'm not just going to carry it with me unless I know I need it. So they're there, they're great tools to have, but is that, that tool you're probably going to grab? Nah, we, we, we have some of these tools, but they're, they're in one cabinet, but they're not together. So we were just talking this morning, we should get a Klein bag, throw them all in a Klein bag, you know, the other night, the, our metal saw came off. The guys went to the rear with the spreaders. I grabbed this because we had a multiple roll-down gates that, that we needed to, to force locks on. I tried doing the lock by myself. I, I, I was not able to do it with the, with the lock breaker. But if I had a partner and I held it and they struck it, and we'll talk about how that works in a minute. And I, I think you guys will like it because it doesn't cost anything. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute uh, as we get to it. So that said, Fences, you go around the rear of a single family, multiple dwelling fences are everywhere. Um, I don't necessarily need a saw. You know, I don't really want to jump over this fence either. If it's chained there, um, here, here's how we handle fences. It's, the way fences work is typically uh, 
the male from the top comes down from the top, the male at the bottom is on the bottom, they pinch together on the females, and that's how the fence swings open and close. So if you go to the bottom hinge, and you pound the, the male from the female, that, uh, what was the hinge side becomes uh, the latching side, you might say, because the chain, the chain is still locked and stuff like that, but you don't necessarily need a saw if you know kind of how the anatomy of how those, those uh, gates work. So scissor gates, ornamental doors, drop bars, clubs, and VPS. Um, again, where do we find these? Uh, pretty typical on the back of a commercial occupancy, a lot of times in the front. Um, we have them on apartment doors. You know, uh, you gotta get into the apartment and then you get up to the apartment door and they'll have scissor gates on, on the apartment door. This is commercial grade scissor gates because they have a channel or a track at the top and bottom. Most scissor gates aren't that ornate. Um, so again, it depends on the occupancy. Um, most of them just kind of, they're flexible at the top and bottom. They just slide over and you lock one side or the other. Um, here's a couple different ways. If I don't have a saw, I'm gonna slide the force of the halogen over the, over the lock or try to drive that pick with the force of the hammer coming down. Maybe we can separate that shackle from the lock body. A lot of times that works. And it's kind of how that lock or uh, duck rope thing works as well. And this is what it looks like. So nothing crazy. Um, you know, put the forks on and just start doing 360s with it. A lot of times if the lock is cheap, uh, they'll separate and uh, or drive uh, the pick through the shackle. So do the size up. If I see scissor gates, that's, that's not the end of the world. There's a uh, karate store down the block from me that has scissor gates. So if you came around at two in the morning, you might go, Pam, I need a saw. But as you approach, it's the scissor gates are locked with a little like Barbie lock. Okay, I mean, it literally, you, it's like a, I don't even, like you put on a jewelry box. Um, so I don't know why anyone would break into a karate store, but if they wanted to, they could get in there pretty easy. It's not that, uh, you know, just do a uh, little size up. It's not all that problematic, so. Uh, and then the other thing with scissor gates, if you got them, and uh, if, if I get up to an apartment door and the lock is on the inside of the lock, what I mean by that is I can't reach it, somebody's in that apartment, especially the front door. If they're on the back door and the lock's inside, that's probably a door that maybe they don't use all the time, but if it's on the door you think that they use closest to the street, there's somebody in that apartment. So, you know, I'm, that's not a search I'm gonna do like this, that's a search I'm gonna do my real search. You know, get on your hands and knees, I expect to find somebody uh, in that apartment. Um, and then, at the end of the day, if somebody's trapped on the other side of the scissor gates, and you absolutely, and all you have is a pickhead axe, pickhead axe don't work on this. What you can do, Reach the bottom of the scissor gate, lift it up as high as you can, and hopefully they can crawl out. Okay, uh, I've had friends that uh, had pick head axes at scissor gates. It didn't work out so well for uh, the people that were involved in that. So when we cut locks, it's the same thing like Rich said. You know, bring the bring the tool to the work, kind of feather it, get a little groove going, then open it up. You're going to have to cut both sides of that uh, heel and toe lock, like we talked about. Uh, this is how that lock breaker works. It drives that wedge shape through between the uh, shackle and the lock body and hopefully we can separate that. So uh, again, it's just a piece of three quarter inch flat stock that's wedge shaped, maybe it goes from zero to maybe three or four inches. Again, if you add, if you drew that on a cocktail napkin, gave it to the body shop guy down the sh street, you could probably make it for 10, you might even make it for free. Um, doesn't cost anything. Um, so when it comes to scissor gates, usually, um, at least on apartment doors, where you might want to consider if you can't defeat the lock and you're going to attack the scissor gate assembly itself or where its attachment points. Maybe that's the weakest link. You know, sometimes they just pull them in with drywall screws. They spent whatever, you know, $300 on scissor gates, but then they used, you know, uh, sheet metal screws to fasten it. That's going to be the weakest link. So um, if you're going to attack the frame, always think about your next move. So the next move is I've got to work on this door at the latching side. Don't force the scissor gate assembly into your work. Force it away from your work. Force it towards the hinge side of that next door, and then go after that next door. When I got to, to uh, with the city, they said, we always force it this way, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put that work in front of your next move. So force it away. They might be lag bolted, and that's obviously, that's not gonna be the weakest link. So it's, you just gotta size it up and, and take a peek. Uh, call for the saw if you need it. Outward swinging ornamental iron doors, these are everywhere. Urban areas, more suburban-like areas of uh, the city. 
I'm sure you guys have these all the time. And again, just this is just a screen. If you reach in, maybe the, maybe it's key and the key's in there or a thumb throw. Just reach in, open it up like a gentleman. Um, or you might need to force this. And again, we'll talk about how to force outward opening doors. These are not a problem. Um, the one thing I would suggest is that after you open it, either break the closer off or just take the whole thing off, get it out of the way. Because inevitably you're gonna go in or they're gonna lead out through there and the door's gonna what? It's gonna pinch the hose and uh, throw it on your lead out. These are the these are the doors we, we, we find, you know, uh, a lot in the rear of commercial structures. It's like there's not a lot of indications where you even need to start. Um, this is a, a rim lock mounted on the outside of the occupancy with a slide bolt. So there could be a challenge. This one's the, uh, got a piece of flat stock over, it's actually over where the door closes. So you're gonna have to peel that away to get the ads in to get to the stop to get around that door. It's, that one's gonna probably give you a hard time. And this one is absolutely gonna give you a hard time. There's obviously some kind of locking mechanism back here. It's screened, so it's hard to get your hand in there. Um, and then every uh, whatever, you know, eight or 10 inches, it has a horizontal piece of uh, flat stock and it's in a metal door and backed up to masonry. There's not gonna be a lot of give or spread in this. So this is, a, this is a door, if I had four or five of these in a row, I'd say bring the spreaders back here. We're gonna need the first tool or, or the, you know, we have battery operated ones, but certainly that's gonna be worth your time moving that power unit. You have a bunch of doors like that. So drop bar. Again, at the end of the day, uh, if you see anything out of the ordinary, uh, for outward swinging doors, you're gonna see the bolt <coughs> heads. This is a CVS pharmacy. The rest, this is my garage, so the rest of these other two, I don't, I don't know where they are. I can't tell you what the occupancy is, but um, you've got bolt heads here. It's an outward swinging door. There's a drop bar there. It may not be in place, but there's a drop bar there, okay? Depending on the time of day, um, there's a drop bar there. This one is on the inside of the occupancy. This is mounted to the frame, so they're from the outside of this thing, as I walk up to it, there's gonna be no indication that this is gonna give me a hard time. Same thing with this one. This is Capcom into the uh, into the masonry. Um, but when we talk about sounding the door, I'm gonna strike it at the top. It's gonna bounce. In the middle, I don't expect a lot of bounce. When I hit it towards the bottom, there's not gonna be as much give or deflection in that door as there should be. So a red flag should go up and go, all right, you know, um, this one's gonna give us a harder time to get in. So if you've got those carriage bolt heads, this is one way to do it with a hand tool. Uh, drive the pit around the bolt head and then just try to drive the bolt head through and or take the saw if you have it available and just shear the bolt heads off as best you can. And he's not trying to skin the door and Matt's gonna show you a way where you can get a nice good cut, a nice cut with these saws. But he's probably taking it at a 45 and he's cutting, he's actually cutting the bolts inside of the door, separating the bolt heads from the threaded rod. What we would offer up is don't worry about the hinge side. What we're concerned is the latching side. If we can get that latching side to break and pop those bolts and that two by four or four by four falls away, then we just attack this normally. So I'm not so concerned about this. If this drops away, it could still be latched at the latching side. So take that one first and maybe you don't have to make both sets of cuts. Uh, door clubs, you could probably buy these again at a hardware store. Um, this is uh, in more urban areas. Uh, the mythological fox lock we'll talk about in a minute. That's kind of how this works, where it's a kicker or a rod that's actually recessed into the floor. And this is more uh, urban. Again, if I, if I sound that door top, middle, I hit that bottom and it doesn't budge, that's a door that's gonna give us a problem. That's a door, this door will fold in half and fall into the building before this door swings open. We're not, I mean, unless I have spreaders or something, I'm not gonna be able to bust this, this two by four is backed up to basically a two by four that's inside of that wall. We're not, we're not gonna move that one. Um, fox locks, police, police locks, currency exchange, that type of stuff. Out of the ordinary, I'll set bolt heads, middle uh, keyway. Okay, this is the door that um, is basically kind of looks like this assembly. Okay, this is common, this, this you'll see. As we move this bar over to the right, that flat stock male recesses into the female, it could be up to two inches. That's gonna be a door we could beat, but it's gonna be a problem. So again, it depends on the occupancy. This door is basically works the same way. That flat stock goes into the female. Um, the weakest link here, hopefully these screws aren't lag bolted in. Hopefully they're just like, just two or three inch uh, screws and we can pop that uh, receptacle off there and, and go after this conventionally. So, but again, anytime you see anything out of the ordinary, you 
be thinking, what, what else am I going to need back there? Uh, BPS, uh, this is the, basically, this would be the contractor door, whether it's the rear, the side, or the front. It's the door where the guy can park his van closest to the building. They go in, they lock themselves in, they work all day, they leave, they, they lock the building up as they go. So um, you got a 50-50 shot at this. They're not hard to get into if you have a saw. Fortunately, conventionally, probably not going to happen so good. But with the saw, if we make this a triangle cut, just big enough where I can reach my hand in towards the hinges, okay, towards the hinges, I can reach in, I can slam that lever down and the door opens up, okay? Um, if you cut it on this side, you're going to ruin this mechanism, and then you're going to have to force that conventionally, and you're going to need the spreaders probably. What happens is there's arms and, and levers in there that go up and out. So if you cut anyone on that side, you cut the arms so they won't move when you go to throw a lever inside, and that door's going to be stuck. You have to cut the door completely apart. You guys have these now, right? That's what I hear. You have yep. a building or two that's starting to have these? Three or four on the north end, and one on the south end. And there's different generations of this now. There's different manufacturers. Yeah, we have now. dogs. I have something else, and they're completely different. Yeah. They <coughs> they're all challenging. Um, the, uh, BPS, they're at 45th and Damon. They're from Chicago. It's a Chicago company. So, and they're all over the country now. So um, they're going to become more prevalent. But um, this was an earlier generation of this one. Um, and again, BPS actually approached the fire department and said, hey, we got this thing. What do you think? Well, how would you get through this? And, if, and, and we said, well, we would do this, this, and this. Okay, great. And they went back to the drawing board. So they're using us to design these doors. They figure if they can keep us out, they can keep, keep bad guys out. So uh, we're kind of our own worst enemy in that regard. This is the door that, that the contractor doesn't use. This isn't the in and out door. There's no way to unlock this door from the outside. It looks like this. It'll have two BPS stamps, one at the top and bottom, and they're just slide bolts in there. Okay, whether or not they lock these doesn't really matter because when we when we go after these, we're going to cut it um, towards the latching side, just on the other side of that bolt. We're going to hopefully shear that slide bolt off, and, and the door should just open. There's two cuts with this particular uh, door. Again, this is dated now. This, this, these are a couple years old now, right? So there's again all these different or newer generations of this one. This was a computer pad. You punch in a code here. Um, one thing to try if you have these computer pad things. Really quick, if, if you're the boss and you're waiting for the saw, try the address. Punch the address in, maybe you get lucky and the door opens. That's you know, a long shot, but it might work. Otherwise, because this latch is all the way down here, there's not a lot you can do forcing this other than just cut it. Make sure you cut all the way through the header and then bring the saw all the way down and you make a door to door. So you'd be cutting just inside of all these locks and then hopefully it just opens up. So we already talked about this. Technique and leverage equals success. It's a 30 inch lever, uh, it's labor intensive, and you should start immediately. So if I'm in an apartment and the engine's shopping and we get there first due or they're pulling up behind us or whatever, I'm gonna start working on that door. I'm gonna force it and I'm gonna control the door. Depending on the fire condition, I might be able to get in and make a little search and then come back. It depends. Maybe I got a hand pump with me, keep the fire in check. All, that, all those things can change from fire to fire. But I'm gonna start working on the door immediately, all right, because I don't want to have the engine wait for the engine. They lead out, they breathe their line, they're ready to go, and then I sound the bottom of this door and it doesn't move. And now I think, oh man, now I'm going to have a problem. So start working on it immediately and control the door. Um, but it may need to be delayed to one degree or another, depending on uh, how long it's, it's going to take to get water. And that, of course, is this time of year, or well, a couple of months we just came through. So it's all seismic. So we talked about the bevel and the concave part of the door. We're just going to show you this up here. We're going to get into this downstairs. But the, the tools designed to create the most leverage with the bevel, okay, towards the door. You'll see that, you'll see that down, downstairs, okay? The problem with that is when you put the bevel towards the jam, okay, this is the door. You can see where those, the tips are pointing into the jam. So unless you're very good with this tool, if it's a tight door, a lot of times what happens is the members uh, are driving this thing so hard and they're not moving the tool. This tool needs to come 90 degrees to the door to actually go in. These tips will get buried into the jam and we never, we're, we're not gonna be able to incorporate that fulcrum because we can't get to the backside because now we're into the jam and you're done. You're spinning your tires, you're done. So what we suggest is the easier way is to put the bevel towards the jam, the concave towards the door, because now you can see the tips. They just want to ride along that jam, get to the backside of that jam, 
get that fulcrum. You can begin to force the door. That might be enough. If it doesn't work, we're going to put a door chock in there, keep the progress, pull the tool out, flip it around, and then reinsert the tool like this, where again, it creates the most uh, leverage. So you'll see. And here's the difference. If you do it the easy way, it doesn't create as much gap, but it's easier to position the tool. So kind of a trade-off. Uh, you, you'll, you'll do it quicker, but it's one extra move. So you can see where that just wants to slide and go in, where, where this one, it can get hung up on the jam, but again, when it's pressed against the door, you get you get a greater... You'll see it better downstairs. Yeah, you'll see it better downstairs. So what we'll do now, with your kind permission, we'll burn through the hands-on stuff, we'll just do it uh, downstairs. But just a couple of quick points. Energy doesn't disappear. When you go to sound these doors, okay, um, this is not a good idea. If I put my back into hitting this door as hard as I can, my hand is there, and the door doesn't budge, you potentially could have just broke your hand. Um, Randy, the same guy that broke this off broke his hand. So I don't know if that's an indicator of what the problem would be. Yeah, he hit the door and went, wow, that hurt a lot. So what do you think he did? <laughs> hit it again. Hit yes. it again. Oh, yeah. Hit it again. Where's the ambulance? So if you're going to do that, you know, and we are, we're going to sound these doors. Position your hands like that so when I hit that... When I hit that door, my hands will slide down the tool uh, as opposed to uh, break my uh, break my uh, hand. So this is just uh, an example of we're, we're getting a little room in this door, a little spread. Keep that progress. Whatever real estate we gain, we, we want to keep as we go through it. Um, and striking the tool, swinging it like a baseball bat, not, not a great idea because our striking surfaces are decreased. If we cross our tools, it's an eight pound ax, it works as efficient, it works, it's eight pounds in this position, it's eight pounds in that position, but as we fatigue or in zero visibility, if you're on the second floor and they're under you, they open that apartment door, what happens to you? You're working on a door above. Now you can't see, now we gotta force that door uh, in zero visibility, right? Smoke comes up, it's the ceiling, banks down on us. So if you can't see, this is just another option so that I don't break my partner's thumb or uh, arm, you know? Just cross your tools. Again, it it's might not be as efficient, but certainly uh, it works almost as well. And then don't choke up. This is a bad uh, spot to be with your hand as well. If you swing and miss, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna hurt yourself. Um, and you can imagine uh, punching a brick wall with uh, you know an eight pound weight in your hand, how bad that's gonna hurt. So, um, if you're having a problem, a real tight door, uh, project door, metal door, metal frame backed up with concrete. Don't try to bluntly force both tips through at the same time. Just camp the tool a little bit, put it on a slight angle, and then you'll start with just the tip. If you can get just the tip in, then you can sneak the rest of it in and uh, and get that full And again, it's been my theory for a long time. Right, <laughs> right exactly. Right. Just the tip. Favorite just game. The tip. I, I just try to sneak that in first, and then That's I figure right. the rest. Start with a little it. pressure, and then just go up the tip. Right? How's your success been, Brian? I'm 50-50. All right. right. Well, whoever that guy is, he's a lucky. He person. is a lucky. <laughs> <guy>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then just one more point I want to make. How do we know? Uh, I always say, how does Stevie Wonder know when the tool is set? Because the tool needs to be set, right? We, we already mentioned it's, we need that full current. Well, in zero visibility, with my oven mitt on, if I drive this, it's, it's going to make a funky sound. You can tell the way the tool feels in your hand. But at the end of the day, with, with my fire glove on, if I feel that crotch, and even with the door stop, and I, and I apologize, it's hard to see. But this is where the door was when we showed up. If, if the crotch is even with the door stop, the tool is set. Okay, and what it looks like on the back side, guys, is, is this. This crotch is even with the stop, and I'm on the back side of that jam, so now I'm in position to force the door. The problem with forcible entry, what we see is guys are um, aggressive to a fault. They, they, you know, you're in the hallway, or everyone's on the front lawn behind you, and everybody's watching you, and, and everyone, you know, you get a little over your skis. So. They'll get it to a point where they think they're set and they're not, and they go to force the door. And I always say, you know, everyone thinks you're a jerk because we're waiting on you. We're like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. You're taking too long. And and then when you, if the tool's not set and you pop it and it falls out, you've kind of confirmed you are a jerk and somebody's going to tell you, all right, step out. You had your turn. You're done. Take an extra second. Be disciplined. Try to tune them out. I know it's hard, sometimes impossible, but the tool needs to be set. It needs to be in that position for it to work. It doesn't work. It's simple physics. It, it won't, I shouldn't say that, it probably won't work if you drive it before it's set. It's probably going to slip on it. Yeah. 
Err on the side of caution. If you think it's set, say, give me five more hits. But we'll make it, you can't drive it too deep, but you can, you can always be sure, okay? That makes sense, right? Right, right. yeah. Wait. So this is, uh, we'll get into all the hands-on stuff. So this is just controlling the door, guys. Again, you can use webbing, you can use that vice grip with a chain, but at the end of the day, we got a 30-inch door grabber with us. Uh, use it to your advantage. Uh, outward swinging doors, this is just how to start to get a gap. If it's tight, maybe start with the X. The, uh, the uh, wedge shape is a little less pronounced than the uh, Helgen. You know, the, every step in this, you see when we get into the hands-on, every move could work, but what every move does is it makes the next move easier. All right, and you'll see that downstairs. So, um, driving this, this is again, we're working inside of that, that uh, the door frame. We're not stepping out of bounds here, that's why we do it this way. But at the end of the day, this door, the tool is driven down to the neck of the tool, and that's when we know it's set. Okay, how do I know it's set? It's past the door stop, and I've got a handle on the door. I'm around the back side of this door. I'm not, we might not get it right away, but we're not gonna lose. It's not gonna pop out. It's set, all right? And that's, we'll get into all this stuff uh, downstairs when we get down, so. Rabbit tool? Rabbit tool. One hand operation. The downfall of the rabbit tool is it is a two person operation. How do you do it with one person? Throw a stitch around the tool itself, wrap the knob, okay, that's one option. Two, throw a stitch around the tool, just let it hang over knob and hold it with your foot, okay? Either way, now you can set the tool to work instead of having someone to physically set the rabbit tool for you and operate it. Just an easier way to maybe operate it. It's quick, efficient, doesn't weigh anything. Okay? Just keep it, you can keep it, pre, keep a, like a six foot loop, three foot loop, pre-hitched to the end of your rabbit tool, then all you gotta do is throw a loop on the, on the door handle, pop it, pull the tool back, and it will pull the webbing back because you got to control the door. Uh, hinges, just this is just another thought. If if I sound the bottom of that door, of course, this is these are outward swing doors. If I don't have a saw, this is just an option. It doesn't always work, but a metal door uh, in a metal frame is going to have um, a finely coursed screw. There's no wood involved in this, so a lot of times those are easy to share. What I what, what you do is come up. You've got your uh, hinges, take a sludge hammer, just start uh, striking the top of them. They're gonna start to, naturally, they're gonna start to kind of pull away like this. Once I get them, you know, that they're starting to show that they're starting to come, I'm shearing the bullheads off, you can slide the forks down and hopefully rip them out. Maybe two guys get on it. The hard part is I can get the top and middle one or the bottom and the middle one. This one's the hard one. So you'd slide the hammer up but at the end of the day, you slide the forks on this and you gotta get between the door and the tool and push it away. That one's, that one's pretty tough. That one can be pretty tough. And with the wood door, uh, maybe even more so. So you, maybe you got a two inch wood screw into that rail that we said that all doors have, but this could be a four inch wood screw into two two by four, the two, the cripple and the, and the other side. So these could be problematic pulling because it's a real coarse thread, it really bites the wood pretty tough. Kind of real quick on hinges as we backtrack this one sec. If you cut those hinges, say the hinge is sticking out right, and you cut it, okay, something that's ha on some of the newer hinges, as you make your little cut here, okay, some of the hinges have a little pin in them, so you can't easily move the door. So you still have to separate the door from the frame, even though you cut the hinges. The only way that won't happen is if you V cut the hinges out. But if you do a cut like this, and you just cut the hinge part here where the pin is, Inside that hinge, when it's closed, there's like a pin that goes each way, a little, just a little tab that it won't easily separate from each other. And on that have note, a uh, lot of those hinges, especially, go ahead, Brian. Have those pins been around for a long time? Because we just encountered them a little while ago, and I, I don't know when. Holy, I'll, I'll, I'll probably, I don't know when they count, but I bet for at least the last five years, yeah, we're starting yeah. to see more. I mean, problems. like 20 years ago. You're talking about no. the tab, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They, yeah. They, it's, they like a a big, it's like a half inch. Right. Pin. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. bent in each way. Yeah, yeah, we met it. It was. Yep. So now to defeat that, it, it, two other options then. So you cut your hinge, okay? Then maybe you gotta do a, a drop cut in right in between the hinge and cut the tip, okay? Or if you can V out all together and just get rid of the whole hinge assembly. I, I used to, when we I was trying to pull them, I hung doors and I, I never ran into them. Yeah. That was, uh, that was, you know. It's more commercial. It's more weight, it's the, yes, it is. depend on the occupancy. Usually commercial. Uh, structures, rear doors, those type of things. Right. You know, if I've got a, a pet shop, I'm not worried about people breaking into. Maybe I'm not going to spend an extra, you know, 10 to 12 bucks on these hinges. But what I would offer up, these are probably maybe case hardened. You're going to, you're going to, if you guys have cut them, you know, you're going to spend some time on these hinges. 
You've got light gauge steel over cardboard. All you've got to do is worry about that rail. Get it through, if this isn't backed up with uh, concrete, that might be quicker. It might be a quicker cut. It's a lighter gauge steel. You know, the door is encased harder. And then again, what's the answer? I don't know how long to get in line. You could try a V cut. You could try bashing the hinges with a sledgehammer and then putting your hand in my rocket, left and right, then up and down. Who knows? There's no no guarantees. So. And like Rich said earlier, it's I got plan A. The, the idea is to have A through Z, not A, B, and then pop an alpha seltzer and take a seizure because you ran out of you ran out of ideas. It's to have all these ideas, you know. You might get that that, that middle and that yeah, bottom hinge, and then Rich, I, oh, I can't. Man, this is dead proud to I know, I know. Disappointed. It's wasted. The sarcasm is wasted. Right. Yeah, if you can get under that door, if you can't get that top hitch, maybe I can pick that door up and start working it like this. It's 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 uh, kind of cavemanish, but again, it's it's uh, we we have got. You know, um, and that's just a thought. And again, the problem with going with hinges is what, especially on commercial occupancies, what do we lose control of? Can't control the door anymore. The door. We lost control of the door. We lost control of ventilation. So we lost. We left. We wrote that uh, off. So Rich mentioned. Uh, you know, some of us have taken the shoulder out of uh, our halogen tools, and again, that just provides another striking surface for uh, diminished visibility or, or closed quarters. If we don't have room, if I'm the hammer guy and I don't have room to swing the tool because I'm hitting the, uh, the uh, hallway, you know, the wall or whatever, I can move on the inside of the tool, and the tool guy steps back and slides along the shaft. So just uh, a couple different ideas. Before you run off, I ask you just to fill out the CEQ so I can get them for you because I'm going to read you back up here. And then after that, we'll meet back down in the apparatus bay floor with your Halligan bars, some, for, some striking tools, rabbit tools if you want. Uh, yesterday, I think we were happy we were just going with helmet and gloves. Um, if you bosses want something more with your guys, that's up to you. Um, you can all force the door. You can not force it. I don't care what you do. It's your door to play with. If you want to do it 20 times or one time, up to you guys. We're just here to over some things with the door. Danny and Matt, that's now that you guys got to talk, sorry. They're gonna talk about forcing the door. So um, bring your striking tools, bring your Halligan bars, um, rabbit tool, and we'll go play. Give me for, it's in uh, 10.35, about 11.45, 11, 